Hello, I'm Brad Williamson. I've been searching for quite a while for some ways of teaching experimental analysis that are not quite so math intensive that provide a model for the students to and a foundation for further development of their math skills later because our, ma our students that show up in biology classes have such a wide range of math abilities. So this is some of the things I've found and working on and it has to do with developing simulation models. And so let's get started. I'm going to start with a problem that's not so much biology, but it involves a biologist, a famous biologist, and that is a problem of this lady who made a claim back in the 1930s that she could test whether the milk was put into a cup of tea first or the tea was put in first. Now, she was at a party in which many of the people expressed serious skepticism, but one person there, Ronald Fisher, suggested how about let's design an experiment and then let's come up with a test that would allow us to make a comparison with the results that she has with the experiment to what a chance event would occur. I got the idea from this web resource from Randall Prum and I think it's a good way to get started in the kind of ideas and thinking that needs to go into analysis. So how about this experiment first? Well my students usually suggest let's give her 10 randomly assigned teacups. You know, there might be 10 with the milk first, uh, I mean, uh, but there may only be three or there may be five, and then present them to her randomly and then she has a chance to choose. Now, with that chance to choose each one, she's got a 50-50 chance, a, one, a chance uh, to get that correct. And let's see what would happen though if it were just by chance. So we suggest, hey, how about let's let 10 coins represent the 10 cups of tea and if it comes up heads, then she got it correct. And if it came up tails, it came, didn't. And this would give us an example of what we'd expect by chance. Five and five. Well, this particular bunch of ten only came up four heads, which would be what we'll call correct heads. And so it wasn't five and five, but it wasn't very far off. So I did it again, and I did it again, and I did it again. And I came up with ten flips, and they were pretty close to the five and five. Uh, didn't vary more than one or uh, on either direction. That was out of 10 flips, but obviously if I kept on flipping these coins, putting them in the cup, turning them out, then I might eventually get all 10 of the coins to come up heads, or I might get all uh, 10 of them to come up tails. Interesting problem. How often would that happen, and so on. Now, I can actually calculate the probability pretty quickly of how of having all 10 come up heads or all 10 come up tails. It's 1 over 1,024. That's 2 raised to the 10th power. Now, that's that's okay, but that's because there's only one way of doing that. Once you get in the middle, there's multiple combinations of 8 correct and 2, for instance, not correct. So how might we do that without actually doing the math calculation? And that's where we do a simulation. I kept on doing this for 50, and you can see that after 50 uh, e experiments, each one of those coin tosses of 10 coins represented an experiment, I actually got one out of 50 with only one, ta uh, one head, which is kind of the opposite. I got two that got eight correct. Two out of 50 be one out of 25, which would be about 4% chance. Now, so that's an estimate of how often that would happen. It's an estimate, it's not a precise calculation. The precise calculation would involve the math. But with a computer, I might be able to do a lot more of these. That took me 30 minutes to do this, 50. I don't want to do that very often. So one thing we could do is a program called Tinkerplots, a spectacular program targeted to middle school. And it's targeted to middle school to help dev uh, develop an understanding of data analysis and probabilities. And it just happens to be perfect for this. So let's bring up a Tinkerplot. I happen to have one. And here we have essentially the coins. Here's a 50-50 chance. I put a zero if they don't, if the guess is incorrect, a one if the guess is correct. And uh, I do that 10 times. So if I tell that to start, oh, that was fast. And in fact, I have it too fast because if I tell it to do it slower, you can see what's going on here. So let's let's uh, let's now speed that up so you can see that I'm doing that 10 different times and it's going to fill that row. So let's go ahead and fill that out and now I've done that 10 times which is a whole lot faster than it took for me to actually flip coins. The problem here is I don't know how many is in each row and of course I can fix that because it is a computer I can tell it to put a sum on there. Yeah excellent. 
Now, I did only did time ten times, and I said I wanted to do it more like 500 times. So let's 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 just go ahead and do a thousand times, and tell it to do that. And that's how fast I did that a thousand times. The only problem is, I don't know what my my results are. Remember, this is this is one of the neat things about this. Check this out. I'm going to plot this. There's all thousand flips right there. The results. That doesn't make sense. Let's put the sum down here on the x-axis. And it starts to categorize these. And look at what happens when I do this. Oh, this is unbelievable. Oh, so in that, in those thousand flips, in those thousand flips, I ended up with uh, at least one time a zero and at least one times a 10. And notice that distribution. That distribution is probability distribution of what I could expect for each one of these. Now it's estimated because this is a simulation. It's not calculated. But the larger number of times I repeat this, the closer it gets to the actual precise calculations for these potential results. And that's the whole idea behind what we're trying to accomplish. Now, not everybody has tinker plots. I understand that, but it might be worth getting. And there's a high school version called Fathom that is equally, um, it's actually even more powerful and more appropriate for a high school biology classroom. But we could switch over to a spreadsheet because every, almost everybody has a spreadsheet. And now I know that some people are challenged by spreadsheets, but it, uh, with a little bit of work, you can do the same kind of stuff. And once you start um, becoming more familiar with them, uh, they work pretty well. But the one thing you do have to do with a spreadsheet, you have to constantly test to make sure that the results you're getting make sense. And in our particular case, for this particular model, we can make a pretty easy spreadsheet with just a little bit of extra skill. And that particular uh, function here is ran between, which selects our coin, 0 or 1 and a count if which helps us to tally our results. And there's other ways of tallying our results, but that's what we'll do for this spreadsheet. So let's build that spreadsheet. And uh, I've got one that's already started. And I've got teacups right here. We're still on the lady drinking tea problem. And so I'm going to put an equals ran between right here. And doing so, I put the bottom number here and I put a comma one those are my two options that I want to give me a random number between zero and one and this time it gave me a one if I tell it to do that again it gives me a zero and what I want to do is copy that for 10 cups now I could have made 12 cups but I did 10 because that's what my students usually do but to copy I've got this open cross I'm going to put it on that little blue square and when it turns solid I can pull it across and I've Look at that. I've got seven that came up correct. Let's uh, total that out. So we put equal sum, and we just drag across all ten of those and hit a return, and I've got a total, and it recalculated again. And it will continue to do that. In fact, I can repeat this experiment, say, ten times, and you can see what we got. Uh, the results in those ten flips. Now I have pre-named a array uh, that goes down to 500 rows, and if I tell this to fill down, it will fill all 500 rows. So I just did 10, uh, 500 experiments, but I don't have them tallied, and this column is our tally. So I, in order to tally this, I'm going to come over here and I'm use the count if, and the count if function. Basically, it looks for a range that you're going to look through and count up uh, any value that meets this criteria. So here's my range. I'm going to tell this to go to K503 because that's how far down it goes. And I'm going to do something else. Because I want to use this, um, because I want to use this quite a bit, I'm going to, well, what's the matter with this? Why isn't that hitting that correctly? Okay, let's try this. There we go. I'm going to make these absolute references. That's what those dollar signs mean, because I want to use the same column every time for these different numbers correct. And I'm going to tell it to look in this 
spot for the number I want, in this case, zero. Now, I don't want that one to be absolute. I want that change as I go across. So again, I copy that across, and I've now tallied how many I have in each category of correct. And I've even already pre-calculated the percent, which basically is taking this number divided by 500. And that is my probability for each one of those. Now, that's an estimated probability that will change every time I tell it to recalculate. Error changed, and so on. It'd be nice to have a visual of this, so I'm going to create a visual. I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to highlight this because that's what I want to graph. Those are the percentages, and I get a nice distribution just like we did in Tinker Plots. But I'm going to format this data series, make it a little bit the bars wider. And the other problem right here is I don't have an 11 up there, so I'm going to collect my X label as this group of numbers right here. And doing so will make this correct now. So out of 500 experiments, I don't have any zeros. But maybe if I told it to recalculate, I could have some zeros or some tens. Or some, and I don't even have any nines this time. So let's recalculate. This time I do. And in fact, with 500, there's still a lot of variation between each time you run 500 experiments. We could total a bunch up, but I could also just go 2,000 rows, which I did in this one. And here we have a more precise estimate of our probabilities involved. Well, that's nifty. Excellent. Now, is this for real? I mean, is this something we can do in a biology classroom? Well, it's a special case. Uh, one in which we call it's a binomial test in which there's only two outcomes. You know, in this case, either you got the T right or you didn't get the T right. Um, here's a here's a study actually in, published in Nature in 96 in which the test was right or left-handedness in toads. Do they show a preference? And in the toads they tested, they got 14 out of 18 preferred their right hand. How could we test that with that spreadsheet? Well, remember, we had 10 columns of teacups. All we need to do this is 18 columns of toads. And we could make a simulation model to estimate our probabilities of getting 14 out of 18. Same thing with the AP Biology Animal Behavior Choice Chambers. So I happen to have some data here that collected from the AP forum. Deborah Hill made a post, and this is some data her, from her students. And notice with the banana, she put a banana at one end of the choice chamber and let the flies choose which way they're going. Her students did. And most of the time, 13 or 14 flies ended up at the banana side of things. Now, out of 17 flies, is that important? Does that show a, a preference for banana? Or could that have just happened purely by chance? Well, one way to look at that is to build a spreadsheet. And again, I've got a spreadsheet that does the flies. And here it is right here. 17 columns of flies, randomly 50-50 on that, and how often that could happen. So here it is. Here's what the, the spreadsheet looks like. Here's what the distribution looked like. And here's our calculated probabilities. Now, this is a cumulative probability. It says 13 or better. 13 or better are on the bananas. And then I total that up, it comes at 2.8%. For this run of 1,000 fly experiments. Notice that the 13 right here says 2% in green. And over here is a little sneaky number that I put in here, which is actually the precise uh, um, probability of getting 13 out of 17 flies. And if I tell it to recalculate, you can see it stays pretty close to that. So. This is a really viable, a really good viable option for helping students develop an understanding of what's going on in a statistical test and how you're going to compare against chance events and make your conclusions. And I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm making my own hypothesis that this will be more clear to the students than just presenting a bunch of formulas to them. I hope to do some more and uh, some other ideas, including resampling, but it'll always be back to the spreadsheets. So I'll catch you later.